Cindy Liu, who is who we're going to be talking about today. Um, and today's question, as last week we talked about um, who will change their identity in reflection to, to Mayor Augustus and, and how his, his identity was based upon self and pride as opposed to humility uh, and care for others, grace, faith. This morning, the question I want us to ask ourselves over and over again to, to reflect on our own is, is uh, who will pursue more? Who will pursue more? If you've seen the film, um, you're going to understand how that connects with Cindy Lou. If not, we're going to help bring it home a little bit. But starting in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled... And all Jerusalem with him. This always kind of surprised me a little bit. Because I can understand why he'd be troubled. It makes sense. He's the king. He has authority over everything. Somebody has risen up. Why was Jerusalem troubled with him? The Messiah they've been waiting for, hoping for, has been silent from the voice of God for hundreds of years. They hear news that he has come, and their response is trouble. Always interests me a little bit. But jump to verse 7. It says, then Herod summoned the wise men secretly. Who knows if you have to do anything in secret? It's probably not anything beneficial or positive to be doing. He has counseled. He has sought out from all these religious uh, wise people about where the Messiah would be born, who he is. And now he's brought these three in secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Liar. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Knowing that as we were reading this, verse 10 stuck in my head as we sang Hosanna. Hosanna. A a cry and a declaration of joy that God is with us. That God has come to save us. It's a joyful time. As believers, this is kind of our starting point for pursuing more. It's not even in my notes. But understand, this has to be our starting point. If we are not rejoicing and filled with joy and gladness and, and thanksgiving over a God who has come to us to save us, we don't have anything to pursue more of. I don't believe we can be dead and be Christians. We can't be passive about the good works that God has done in our lives and be followers of Christ. It's impossible. Whenever I see people who are just dreaded and who are filled with with frustration and anger all the time, who don't show a joy or a peace at all in their lives, I'm not talking about seasons. I'm talking about it is not a characteristic of them. You know what I'm talking about. Who remembers... Maybe you've never seen it, but has anybody seen or heard of an, an old skit called Debbie Downer? Debbie Downer can't find anything good about anything. They're at Disney World, and she's talking about all the death high, all the high death numbers that take place at amusement parks. Talking about all these chaotic things that in life where her her cats can't have babies and just one thing after another it, it, nothing positive can go on in Debbie's life it reminds me of in college we were a bunch of us were at Brahms one night and we're just laughing and, and joking and telling all these stories and who has ever had an inappropriate response of laughter at a very distraught piece of news Anybody ever done that because you received it at the wrong moment in time that was an inappropriate moment and caught you off guard and all you could do is laugh? This was one of those moments. We're all laughing, having a good time, joking. It's kind of one of those everybody's crying, laughing so hard. And out of nowhere, our group's Debbie Downer goes, my cousin has cancer. And I lost it. I I couldn't help it. I, I was crying and apologizing at the same time because it was so inappropriate of my response, but the timing was so wrong. And it makes me think how many of us 
or we know people who don't have a characteristic of joy, and they're in the middle of a situation or middle of a group of people who are following Christ and are filled with the thanksgiving and the goodness and the gladness of what God's done in their life, and they're claiming Jesus, but all they're doing is spewing everything that is dead in their life. You can't pursue more if you don't even have it to start with. And what you fruition in your life, what you produce is a solid sign of who you are. I'm tired of hearing people say, or hearing, yeah, I'm tired of hearing people say, you can't judge me. I can show you in scripture where that's wrong. I, I can. I can show you where I am able to judge your fruit. And so if you are somebody who is lousy and full of, of frustration and full of, of death in their tongue and somebody who is never full of joy or hope or love, I can judge that fruit and have a pretty good idea of who the seed is that grew it. I can do that. And so we're seeing this, and they're full of joy and thanksgiving and gratitude, and they've offered it and shown it and praised Jesus. And I thought of Hosanna. Hosanna. And how many of us, if we're not careful to pursue more, will find ourselves on that Palm Sunday or on this Christmas morning praising God, crying out Hosanna with joy and gladness. And then when Friday comes... We're nowhere to be seen. Why? We have to pursue more. This morning, that's exactly what we're going to talk about, pursuing more. And we're going to talk about three things that are required to help us pursue more. The first one is watching. We have to watch. We have to observe. We have to study. We have to take note. We have to watch if we are going to pursue more. We're going to see this in verses 1 and 2 of, of Matthew 2. It says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. Has anybody ever noticed a brand new star? I haven't. And in fact, if I don't see those cool little um, headlines on Facebook that tell me to look for something, I am never going to notice it. Did anybody know that this past week that the International Space Station flew right over Baldwin? That was cool. Anybody know on December 21st, about 45 minutes after sundown, that we're supposed to have an awesome visual of what's called a Christmas star, where Jupiter and Saturn are lined up, just barely separated? It's really cool. If I didn't see those really neat Facebook articles and I didn't share them, I promise you I would never notice them. It's interesting that these wise men, or as scripture also calls them kings, saw this star. They noticed it. So if they saw it, it tells me they were looking. They were watching. They were observing. They were studying. They were studying it. It's kind of like people who are really tidy, and you go to, your house, you go to their house, and, and you move something over like five inches, and they come back by, and they're like, that's not where that belongs. They've studied it. They know it. They have observed it. We cannot pursue more without watching God. We cannot pursue more without studying and observing. It's interesting to me. Interesting that they saw it. So the first thing I want to talk about with watching is when we watch, when we observe, what is it that we're watching and observing? It's first is God's word. We have to watch and observe that thing. We have to know it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. Who believes that? All Scripture is. All of it. Even the stuff that I don't like or agree with. I, I think I've shared it once, but Francis Chan once, once said that if I read something in Scripture that I disagree with, I must assume that I am wrong. All of it is breathed by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. That's the one that I don't like sometimes. Because God whoops me around and says, you're prideful, get rid of it. I don't like that. I need it. And for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let me put that in there, the man or woman. This is all inclusive. We have to study it so we can be full and complete, lacking nothing. So in short, what this scripture tells us is that observing God's word, studying it, knowing it, seeing it, watching it, equips us and makes us whole in God. Makes us complete. So we can walk around some days and we might be sitting around and we might be followers of Christ and we know and love Jesus and we think to ourselves, God, something is missing. Something's not 
something's missing. It's not right. I don't feel full. Let me point you first back to his scripture. It equips us that we may be lacking nothing. It makes us whole and complete. It builds us up. We have to study it. We have to know it. First Timothy 4.1, because apparently Timothy needed these follow-ups. He needed this encouragement. Everybody, anybody else need encouragement or follow-ups on truth? Anybody read something yesterday that revolutionized your life, and then today you're like, what was that? I the only one? Okay. <laughs> I do it a lot. I'm like, man, that hit home is going to change my life. And then tomorrow I'll wake up and I'm like, where was that at again? Where, where was that? And then I find myself in the middle of a situation where I responded back in my nature. And I'm like, I've got to go back and re- re- reread that and remind myself of it. Timothy's getting these reminders from, from Paul, his spiritual father. But in 1 Timothy 4, 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith. This kind of goes against a lot of teachings out there that says, once I come to God, I can never be removed from him. Kind of contradicts that a little bit on that teaching because it's up to us and our response of devotion. It says in the later times. I feel like when he wrote this to Timothy to today, we're definitely in later times. We're in later times. In later times, some will depart the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. How can we be deceived? How can we be pulled away and fooled by a teaching of demonic activity because we haven't pursued the study of God's word? If we don't know his word, we're going to be fooled by theirs. That's why so many within the church are okay to stand at this pulpit and say, this is good when God has clearly called it evil. The scripture warns us of that, not to do it. We can't accept anything contrary to the word. Again, we agreed all scripture is breathed by God, whether I like it or not. Whether it agrees with my lifestyle or not. Whether it supports the person's lifestyle I love or not. It's all breathed by God. And if I am not studying it and accepting it and planning it in my, to my life and letting it define me through my study, through my observation, through my watching, I will be pulled away. I will fall away. You will fall away. We're not strong enough. We're not strong enough aside from the word of God and the spirit of God in our lives. When we watch, we have to watch and observe God's word. He's let us grow. It equips us. And as we equip and we learn and we know, we can discern the spirits that are teaching. We can discern it. We can look at somebody or something, and we can discern that if that agrees with Scripture or not. And if it doesn't, I know I don't have to receive it. Not if it agrees with me, if it agrees with Scripture. The second thing we need to watch or observe is people. we got to watch and observe people. Here's why. 2 Timothy 3.15 says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. We're talking about these later days, these last days again. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful and unholy. They'll be heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying his power avoid such people. That's a long list. So what I want you to do, whether you're here online, write it down, put it in your phone, I want you to go back and read this scripture again. Go back and read it again. we got to observe it. <laughs> We've got to watch it. Because if you find yourself in this line, then you're at a place of avoidance. And if God is telling me to avoid, I can only imagine that he's telling me to follow his actions. I don't want to be void of God's presence and word in my life. Read it again. Make sure that this doesn't describe or define you, not as a moment of weakness, but as a character, as who you are. Make sure that you're changed. Last week we talked about changing identity. This should not be your identity. Not if you're pursuing more. Should never be. Why do we observe people? Because we have to observe the company we keep. Not the company we minister to, but the company we keep close to us. We have to. 
I get it. Jesus said to the Pharisees that the, the hospital is not for the healthy but the sick. We've got to minister to them. We have to be there for the, wor- for the world that's broken and hurting. But the people we keep closest to us, the people that we let speak and feed into our lives, the people that we imitate and follow, better be following Christ. They better be reflecting the identity of Christ. They better be pursuing more of Christ. It has to happen. Observe people and compare them. Compare their fruit to the word of God that you've been studying and observing. Compare it and check it. Why? Why? Matthew 24, 24. Straight from the mouth of Jesus himself. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So why do you need to check your company? Because Satan is after you. He's after the church, yes. But believe that just as God has assigned an angel to you, that Satan has assigned a demon to you. And he is after to specifically still kill and destroy you. You're his goal. You're his end game. You're his, you're his hope. You are why he is after. And if he can get you to compromise your company, if he can get you to compromise the fruit of what you allow in your presence, the fruit of what you allow yourself to take of, if he can get you to compromise it, then he can get you to quit observing the word of God. Because people who look like 2 Timothy 3.15 promise you they're not observing the word of God. They might read it so they can debate it against you. But they're not taking it in. They're not studying it. They're not chewing it up. They're not growing from it. And if you allow yourself the company of these, then they will pull you from the study of the word. Do not allow it to happen. But you can only do it by observing. Observe the scripture so you know it, and then observe people to compare it to the word of God. Second, if you want to pursue more, it requires listening. Listening. We see in verse 12 here, it says, and being warned in a dream. It's very interesting how this Christmas story begins with so many dreams. God is speaking all over the place. He's setting the tables. He's playing chess. Chess against the enemy, against the kings of the earth, chess against all of it. Because he's planning and preparing. You have this move in, in, in mind, but I want you to go somewhere else. They're setting you up for a checkmate, and I'm setting you up for success, for the victory. He says, in a dream, they were warned not to return to Herod. They departed to their own country by another way. Listening, they listened to the word of God. They listened to the warning and obeyed it. They took heed. They understood. They didn't just hear it. They listened to it. Listening is a requirement for pursuing more. For pursuing more. My kids are at this age where they hear me. They don't listen to me. They hear me all day long. They don't listen. I know this because when I wake up in the morning to get ready for Sunday and has her eyes in the living room and he shouldn't be yet, and I say, go to your bedroom, he looks at me and then turns and lays down on the couch. (laughs) That's not what I said, and you know that's not what I said. There's a difference between hearing and listening. We're going to pursue more. We have to listen. We have to listen. What are we listening to? First, we're listening to the Holy Spirit. Listening to the Holy Spirit. John 10, verses 2 through 4 says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. You can't know the voice of somebody you've not listened to. It can't happen. It cannot happen. I remember when I was in college, my, my pastor was kind of talking on this, on this point a little bit, and, and he had called my name, and he asked me to go to the back of the sanctuary. Now, the sanctuary we were at was kind of a temporary place of worship because we were finishing up the sanctuary, but it was two basketball courts side by side. He's on one end, and he wants me to go to the far other end. And he tells me, he goes, when you hear me, you know, let me know. But, but what he didn't tell me is that, um, he wanted me to go out of the room for a moment. And when I was out of the room, he told the church that he was going to call me without a microphone. 
And so I come in, he's just talking to the church, and he's preaching, he's preaching, and I'm just walking back and forth, and he wanted me to listen to music, too. And so I'm walking back and forth, listening to music, he pulls around the microphone, and he goes, Justin, and my head snapped. And he was validating a point that I hope you understand without me depicting it. Even in the middle of chaos, even in the middle of all the noise, even in the middle of the world around us, everybody's screaming fire. Everybody believes they're seeing wolves and they're crying wolf. Even in the middle of all of that, if we are listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, all he has to do is pull it away and call out your name. And if you've listened, you've heard it. You know it. Listen, his sheep know his voice. If you don't hear the voice of God in chaos and you don't understand which is the voice out of all the ones you're hearing, we have to reflect. We have to ask the hard questions now because scripture says, if you're his sheep, you'll know it. So now we have to ask, God, where have I allowed a new shepherd in? What voice have I been allowing to control and to dictate and to guide my movement and realign and reevaluate so we can hear and know the voice of God and the shepherd? We have to listen to it. John 16, 13 points, it says it this way. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. For he will not speak on his own authority. Who is he speaking by? God. But whatever he hears, we can put in there of God, from God. He will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. I wanted to put this in here because even though we might be somebody got church and, and we might be Pentecostal by, by title, not all people who follow Jesus, especially they go to Pentecostal somebody got churches, are comfortable with the idea of the Holy Spirit. They're not comfortable with it. And what I simply want to navigate in this idea is that the Holy Spirit is subject to the Father. He's subject to the Father. He does not get to speak without the Father's authority. And he does not get to speak anything other than what the Father has said. So if you know the voice of God, if you've studied his word and you know it and you understand it because you've observed it and you've kept away bad fruit and you trust the word of God and you trust the voice of God and you lean on it and believe it, be comforted by the voice of the Holy Spirit. You can trust it. It's not a freak thing. It's not some circus act. It's not something that makes you uncomfortable. He is here for us, for wisdom and knowledge and comfort and peace. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Secondly, listening requires obedience to the Holy Spirit. Like I said, it's different to hear and to listen. My son can hear me, but until he does what I said, I don't believe he's listening to me. Listening requires obedience to the Holy Spirit. You've got to trust that voice and listen to him so you can obey him. John 8, 47 says, whoever is of God, hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Ow. Ow. Like I said, his sheep know his voice. If you can't pick out his voice from the chaos and you don't know it, we have to evaluate because John says clearly, clearly that you don't hear it because you're not of God. That's hard. That's a hard understanding. How can I live my life within the walls of the church? I've been here every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Saturday evening prayer times, Tuesday classes. I've been here and open and closed in my whole life. How can you tell me I'm not from God? Because it's not about the actions. It's about the obedience. I've done a lot of things for God in my life that weren't necessarily told me to be done by God. Sometimes he told me to sit and stop. And I went and did. It's not obedience. What is it that God said to David? It is better to obey than sacrifice. He desires our obedience. So how can I live within these walls and not know him? It's because you deceived yourself by not obeying his commands. James 1.22 clarifies, it says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. 
do the word. Obey the word. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the voice of God and obey it. Because if all you do is sit in here, you're deceiving yourselves. It is impossible to treat the church like a country club or to treat it like a buffet, to just constantly eat all you want and never serve back. It's impossible to do that and to be walking in the knowledge and the wisdom and the intimacy with God. Scripture says if you're not doing anything with it, you are deceiving yourselves. If you are not hearing the word of God anymore, it's probably because you've got to a place where he understands you're not going to obey. God knows us better than anybody. You know your kids better than they know themselves some days. And you already know, if you tell them to do something, what the response will be. I know. I know when Eliana gets in trouble and I swat her butt, she's going to cry and she's going to say, Daddy, spank me. Daddy, spank me. I know that's going to be her response every time. I know it's going to happen. I know when I put Joe Ash down for bed and Azariah for bed and I say, don't be talking or laughing or screaming or fighting. Joe Ash, don't rock your head or thump your head because it's going to keep your brother awake. Do you understand me? He's going to say, yes. I'm going to shut the door. And 30 seconds later, I'm here. Where he's rocking his head and thumping it. Because I know them. God knows us intimately. And if you are at a place where you can say, Pastor, I've not heard God's voice telling me to do anything in a while. It's because he knows you won't do it. It's a hard reality and a hard truth. We are at later times and last times. We are there. What is it that Jesus told his disciples when they go into a town and they don't welcome them? He said to leave and kick the dust off their feet. We are at a place when we look at people and we can know the fruit and we can know the intention in the heart that it is okay. It's okay to say you're not listening. You're not listening and you're not receiving. I'm kicking off the dust. It's okay. We have not enough time to waste on somebody who will never receive the word of God. When there's 10 who will if we just went to them. And God is the same way. He knows time's running out. He's the only one, the Father, who knows the day and the hour. And he's looking at people within the walls of the church and outside. And he's saying, you're not going to obey. You're not going to listen. I do not want God to dust his feet off at me. I don't want him to dust his feet off at you. If he tells you to do it, do it. Do not deceive yourselves. It is not enough to hear him. It's not enough. When he says, do you understand me? Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Then do it. Then do it. The third requirement for pursuing more is challenging. Challenging, literally. <laughs> You need to challenge some stuff. Verse 11, we see here with the wise men, with the wise kings. It says, In going to the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they had offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. That seems really sweet. Seems really kind and a, and a good gesture. Who has known many kings or heard of many kings or leaders who kneel and bow down to other kings? I don't want names because I know you might know some modern people maybe, but we don't need that. But in all honesty, who knows the king that's going to go and kneel at another king and worship them and give them gifts? That doesn't happen. That's not a normal thing. That is a challenging thing. They had to challenge their nature. Their kings, they're used to being lifted up and served. They're used to being exalted. And now they're kneeling and worshiping? That challenged the normal. That challenged their nature. That challenged what the world was like. And not only were they doing it to a king, but it wasn't even a king that had proven themselves. Not even a king that proved themselves. It's a baby in a manger that was challenging. It challenged the world and the perspective and the perception. So what is it we need to challenge? We need to challenge the norm. Challenge the norm. James 4.4 4 says, oh, this is a fun way to start it. You adulterous people. 
Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This is the norm. This is the norm. If you were to get numbers and and stats, you will probably see more non-Christians in the world than you will Christians. Therefore, the norm would be of the world. That is the norm. And it is a place of of complete um, conflict with the things of God. Their interests are completely conflicting. I cannot look at God and him give me a list of what he wants and desires and his interests in life and then look at the world and them give me it. It won't align. It won't match up. They're not the same. They conflict with each other. And when we talk about the world, we're talking about specifically the spiritual world run by Satan. It will not align. They're not of the same interests and desires. The fruits of the world don't gratify or line up with the fruits of God. They're not in comparison. They conflict far too much. They conflict. Therefore, we cannot invest in both. Can't do it. You can't look at the list of interests on the world side of things and say, oh, I like that, 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 but I really like this stuff on God's side too. We don't get to order menu style. It's not how it works in relationship with God and pursuing God and pursuing all he has for us. It's all or nothing. We are committed in alignment with him or we are an enemy with him. That's all the choices are. When you talk to somebody, and, and, and I've heard it over and over again, man, I, I, I believe that you're telling me the truth. I believe that Jesus may have really come from heaven as the son of God, but I don't know if I'm ready. I don't hate him. But I don't know if I'm ready to be a Christian. You may think you're on the fence. You're an enemy. You cannot be in conflict with the interests of God and still, still be an ally with him. We have to challenge the norm. We have to challenge the world. 1 John 2, 15 and 17 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. Challenge it. Don't love it. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Very simple. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Abides forever. Challenge the norm. How do we do that? Simply put at the end, do the will of God of God. Listen, watch, listen, obey. When you begin to obey the voice and the will, the desire, the interest of God, and you begin to walk in fulfilling its desire over yours, then you are challenging the norm. You are separating yourself and pursuing more of God in your life. Challenge the norm, but also challenge your nature. Challenge your nature. Galatians 5.16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Go back and read that chapter too. I talked about earlier the 2 Timothy 3.15 and seeing if you reflect any of those. Read Galatians 5. See if you reflect the things of the flesh or the, the, the fruits of the Spirit. Reflect and challenge Challenge your nature. Your nature is going to want to align with the conflicting desires of the world. It's going to happen. Scripture says that we were all born sinful. We were all born into evil, and we were all born separated from God. What that tells me is by nature, I will never naturally pursue the goodness of God. I have to challenge and intentionally do that. I'm never just going to walk up each day without thinking about it and naturally walk in the footsteps of God. Not going to happen. I am going to, by nature, walk in the steps of this world until I choose to look down and say, this is where he's taking me. My nature has to be challenged. It wants to align with the world's desires. It, 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 It wants to. But how do we walk in God's nature? We read the scripture a lot, but 12, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And Scott, if you would, come on up here at this point. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
Do not be conformed to this world. And hold off on playing for a moment. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is how you challenge it. This is how you do it. You dive in and, and you intentionally pursue and follow, but it requires watching, observing, studying the Word of God. It requires listening, obeying, doing what the Holy Spirit has told you. This is how you transform. If you would, there's a picture on there, Cheyenne. Can you show that picture? I want us to see the difference between the transform, not conform. You'll see the words in front of it. It's the same. That picture's the same. But this is what it looks like to conform. Do you even see what's there? Do you see a rug there? It takes a lot of watching and looking, doesn't it? You really have to, because if you're just walking by or looking at a glimpse, it just looks like the stones and the pathway. This is what conformation looks like. What you were created to do and be is no longer of value. It is no longer good. It is no longer usable. You have been broken down, torn down, and tossed aside. You've lost your value and your purpose when you conform. When you choose not to pursue more of God, you choose to conform. I had a video I was going to play. We're not going to do it, but talking about this challenging, talking about this listening and this watching, and it was Cindy Lou. She did this. She watched throughout the entire movie. You see, she's looking at the town as the entire Whoville is running around and buying gifts and wrapping presents and doing all these things. And, and all she can think is, is this really all Christmas is about? Is this really all it's about? And when Santa comes, the Grinch, and she catches him, he asks her what she wants. She said, I don't even know what I want. And she says, Santa, what is Christmas about? And the Grinch, he's frustrated because he sees the same thing she sees. But instead of pursuing more, he becomes bitter and angry. And he says, why, of course, the presence. It's always been about the presence. She's watching and she's seeing what the world is showing her. She's watching and seeing what the norm has been. And she's trying to figure it out. She's listening to everything that's being said. And at one point in the song, she's in her bedroom. And she sings this lovely song that we may have heard if we watched it. Where are you, Christmas? I cannot find you. And there's a part in the song that has said, my world is changing. I'm rearranging. Does that mean Christmas changes too? She's trying to figure it out. She's, she's questioning and, and asking and, and doing all these things. And, and the one thing I want to bring about in that before we get ready to go into a time of worship, time of prayer, do what you need to do with God there. Challenge yourself. If you need to repent, repent. If you need to pursue more, pursue more. If you need a relationship with God, request it. But before we go into that, the one thing I want to say is it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to even question God at times. And I want to back this up. What I mean this is when you're asking to learn, when you're asking to know, when you're asking to grow, it's okay. It's okay. Challenge it. Because the problem is, is too often we've been afraid to ask and we have blind faith without any substance. And when somebody comes through and life gets crazy and they ask us or we have to ask ourselves, why do I believe this? If it's been blind, the answer is I don't know. I don't know why I believe it because I was told to. Because it's what I've always known. It's what I've always done. That won't keep you. That won't hold you. In fact, I believe Jesus says that that is like the winds and the thorns coming and choking us out and washing us away. We've not been planted very well if we don't ask the questions. Get some good soil. Get some deep soil. Toil it. Dig it up. Go deep. Ask the question so that way you know why you know. How do I know that God heals? Because I've seen it. I've seen it. How do I know that God still hears my voice? Because he's confirmed it to me through questions and tears I've cried when no one was around. How do I know? How do I know God's good when the world is crazy? Because I've tasted and seen of his goodness and grace. How do I know he's so wise and I'm so dumb? Because I know me. 
I know me. That's how. When we question and we challenge, then what happens when we come through the other side? We come even closer to God. Because what he says is, you now know me better. You don't know me vaguely. You don't know me from a distance. It's not that if I was in a crowd of people, you could point me out because I'm a head taller. Or you know what kind of clothes I wear. But it's now questioning, who am I? Anna had to get a marriage license reprinted this week, so she get her license done. And when she was there, they began to ask her questions like, what's your husband's name? When was he born? Where was he born? Who's his parents? How bad would it have been if my wife couldn't have answered those questions? <laughs> been pretty sad. It wouldn't have been a very intimate relationship. But how sad is it we can spend our whole life inside the walls of a church, and when time comes and the world asks us these questions... We can't answer them because we don't know, because we haven't been watching. We haven't been listening. We haven't been challenging. Pursue more. There's so much more than the the basic average church has pursued from my perspective of life. It's not been that long, but I've been to a few different places. I've seen how a lot of Christians tend to be comfortable with right here and right now. We can't afford that. We can't afford that. Pursue more. If you want to go ahead and stand up, we're going to close out with a few songs. Pray. The altar's open. If you want prayer, we'll pray for you. If you're at home and you need prayer, message us, write us, let us know. And if you need a relationship with God, if you need a starting point to pursue, Scripture says you just have to believe with your heart that Jesus was come from heaven as a son of God and died for your sins. Confess it with your mouth. As simple as that. If you've made that prayer today, let us know. We want to celebrate that with you. We want to honor that with you. And we want to encourage you up. Also, last thing I want to say before we get going, today is Mission Sunday. It is Mission Sunday. Mission Sunday this year has been very different because half the time we're here and half the time we're not. A lot of things have gone online now or the boxes in the back. But please don't forget our missionaries. Please don't forget them. I got a letter from the Rice family this week, and, and they just said thank you for what we've done, but at the same time, the airlines are now opening back up for them to return, and, and they're still short the funds they need. But they said their people are just so deeply awaiting and looking forward and hoping for their arrival again. They have people that need them, people we may never see, Names we may never know, voices we may never hear, but they're relying on you. So please, as as you give your tithe and your your, your regular tithe, any specific offerings you have, also give that offering above and beyond to our missions today. Support that, lift it up, encourage it. God is going to bless you for it. Pursue more.
last thing I wanted to say as we get ready to close out this morning is in a world full of gift hungry who's be a Cindy Lou who I was thinking about the end of the film and uh, it's not quite the end of the film but it's the end of this holiday celebration and, and Cindy Lou through listening and watching challenged the norm she invited the Grinch to be the holiday cheermeister the one what in all of Whoville that hated Christmas. She encouraged and invited to be the holiday cheermeister. And he went and he, he, he was flabbergasted and shoved fudge in his face and did all these things. We talked about last week where the, the mayor taunted him with, the, with the, the razor. But she did all this and then he stole Christmas the following night. And, and in the morning, the mayor's there and he says, I hope you're proud of yourself. And the father steps up and steps in front of her. And he said, if she's not, I am. If she's not, I am. And he says, oh, you're, you're proud that she stole Christmas, this little girl. And he said, that little girl happens to be my daughter. And she happens to be right. And God spoke to me. And he encouraged my heart that as we listen and watch and challenge then in the end, the world's going to point the fingers and mock and ridicule. But he's going to step in front and he's going to say, I'm proud of her. I'm proud of him. And they did right. They were right. They spoke right. They loved right. They acted right. They served right. They happened to be right. And all I can think is if your heart's desire, the one thing you want in this world is nothing short of the Father to stand in front of you and say, I am proud of you. You were right. Listen. Watch. Challenge. Be a Cindy Lou Who in a world full of Who's and Watts and Grinches and Mayors. Challenge it and do something about it according to the heart and the word and the voice of God.